and it, it's unfortunate, but they have created the situation for themselves. It's of their doing, it's their creation. And if they've got angry neighbors, then start being a better neighbor yourself. You know, maybe give back some of the, of the land you've stolen from uh, the Palestinians. Maybe have a plan uh, to divide uh, the, uh, the territory more equitably, where you're not trying to squeeze them off of every square inch. Mike Harris, thank you so much for coming to my show. How are you doing? I am well. Thank you so much for inviting me. It is always a, an honor and a privilege uh, to be interviewed in a format like this and be able to address audiences uh, from around the world instead of just locally in our, our jurisdiction here in the USA. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mike. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I can call you really a good friend of mine because I, I met you personally. I know your, your vast, uh, you know, in-depth knowledge, whether it be geopolitics, technology, uh, the interconnected, you know, topics that you, that you can talk about. So let's just go straight uh, to the, you know, most sensitive taboo topic since it's, you know, currently unfolding tragically and really sadly. It makes me really sad, sad and, and depressed, uh, to be honest with you, seeing all those innocent um I, I don't really care whether it's on the Israeli side or on the Palestinian side. Uh, it really makes me sad and depressed. Um, but let's just go a little bit because I know you've uh, uh, talked about this. You've written articles about this together, I think, also with Dr. Preston James on the uh, roots of the Khazarian mafia. And I think people don't have a notion of they cannot differentiate between Judaism, real Judaism, or Torah Judaism, and the Khazarian oligarchy, Khazarian mafia. Can you maybe give a little bit more, a more maybe comprehensive or, or holistic overview uh, from your perspective? There are enough interviews out there. I can direct people to those interviews that you've already done so that people can get a grasp of um, why um, things are talked about and not talked about. And and then maybe, uh, but before we, we do that, maybe I'll, I'll just introduce you for people, you know, who might not know you. He, you are the Veterans Today Financial Editor, uh, podcast, radio show host of The Short End of the Stick, 30 years in man manufacturing, financial and technology sector. You've been core in numerous uh, domestic, international startups, acquisition mergers, uh, skyrot skyrocketing profit margins through highly cooperative, collaborative team approach, um, and so on. I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's a huge, I mean, uh, yeah, a curriculum vitae about you. Uh, technical advisor to the Committee on Science and Technology of the U.S. Congress, as well as sitting as chairman of various boards over the years. Um is there anything I, I missed? Is there anything important besides that you are, have you have an MBA in finance foundation and uh, you have a, in, um, applied physics and economics and exceptional ability to function well above and beyond the box, outside the box? <laughs> well, thank you for that. I, I do appreciate uh, the kind words. Uh, I'm just a regular schlub like anybody else, but uh, I, I try to keep my eyes open and my ears open and listen more than I speak. And uh, you learn things that way. And so uh, what I try to do is apply my hard earned life experience uh, to what I see going on in the world. And that's really how I form a lot of my opinions and perspectives. But uh, again, thank you for inviting me on. It truly is an honor and a privilege. Well, thank you. Uh, Mike, uh, can you Talk a little bit about the roots. Um, I mean, we don't have to go deep into this there since 1948, since the creation. I mean, we got to, I have to say this. I mean, is the state of Israel an artificially created state? Is it or not? It's absolutely artificially created. Absolutely. There, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about this. Now, let's go back to the Khazarian Mafia because that needs a little bit of, of addressing here. Uh, if people are not familiar with their history, there was uh, an empire located in the neighborhood uh, around the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea uh, going back, oh, you know, 12, 1300 years ago called Khazaria. And they were a really bad empire. They were sort of at the confluence there where the Silk Road inter integrated with, uh, with, with Europe. And so they set themselves up as a really a kingdom of robbers and bandits. And they would intersect uh, people traveling from uh, Europe to China, China to Europe. And they would steal their identities, steal their goods, and, and assume that person's uh, reality is their own. Uh, this went on for a long time. They were slavers. They were 
just brutal and uh, very hard to, they were not a good neighbor. And so what happened is the Rus, the Russians, what, what developed into Russia, uh, decided they had enough of it and uh, they, they, they started you know, waging a campaign against them. And then uh, the Persians did the same thing almost simultaneously because they were both sides were tired of uh, this group in the middle disrupting their lives and, and their, their commerce, their trade. Uh, so they interceded, a war ensued, the Khazarians lost. And so that is the, the beginning of the hatred of these Khazarians towards Russians and towards Persians, which now we call Iran. And so that, that grudge has never gone away. Uh, they're still there. They're still fighting it. Uh, the Khazari and royal family escaped, of course. Royal families typically do. And uh, But these people were pushed all throughout Europe. And so there, there are no indigenous uh, uh, Khazarians left in, in that neighborhood, or very few, let's say. But, but they spread all throughout you know, Germany, Poland, Russia, um, the, the entire European continent. There. So th that's how they got spread out. But... Um, they they held this grudge. They they, they have a uh, a tribalness to them that they recognize each other and only each other, and they they, they do commerce with each other. Everybody else they they they, they try. They're they're not open handed with. They they don't uh, deal deal fairly with. And so that's been going on now for well since 800 900 A.D. Uh, when they were forced to convert. See uh, when this when this conflict started, they, uh, the the Organized the civilized powers, the Persians, the Russians, said, "Look, you've got to, you know, accept an Abrahamic religion. You've got to accept Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. But you've got to have some moral basis to your lives." And so they sat them down uh, with the king, and uh, King Bulan, his name was, and they said, "Look, pick a religion and live by, adhere to these, uh, you know, to the uh, rules and covenants of that religion." So he thought it over and he looked at Judaism and that's the one that he chose. And so when it circle back to modern times now, you look at the people who are living in Israel now, they're all Ashkenazi Jews, which means they don't have any Abrahamic blood in them. These are not the Hebrews of the Bible. These are not the Hebrews of the Torah uh, that, that we're talking about. These are people who are an artificial construct who adopted Judaism as a window dressing religion, when in reality their leadership has always been ball worshippers, Satan worshippers, if you will. And uh, the way that they handle themselves in day to day commerce, even to this day, it's obvious that these are, are people who, do, who are not, uh, they're not speaking with the goodness of God in their heart. They're, they're speaking uh, with, with the badness, really, of, of, uh, of the Satan in their heart. And so uh, that, that's really what we are. And, 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 to your other question about is Israel an artificial construct? Absolutely, because the people who are occupying Israel today do not have any drop of that blood in their in their body. They're, they're genetically they're not the same. The people who live in Palestine today, uh, the, the Palestinian Muslims, have all Semitic blood. They are the the blood relatives, if you will, of of the Hebrews of the Bible that this story was written about, uh, the, the whole thing. They're the true inheritors of that land. And um, you know, like it's, these people have never been there. They've never lived there. They have no claim at all to it. Um, yeah, I want to just back it up uh, because, I mean, there's a great article that uh, Preston James, I think, wrote, um, and, and you've done a lot, you know, a bunch of interviews in connection with that article. It's called, uh, uh, what is it called? The Hidden uh, History of the Incredibly Evil Khazarian Mafia. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, The Secret History of Khazarian Mafia and its Evil Plan to Hijack the Whole World Now Revealed for the First Time. And it says actually in that article somewhere, it's it's uh, many pages long, and um, it talks about uh, they actually did some genetic testing, I think, at the Stanford University where no, they found that because John, it's John. always talked about, you know, Semitic blood or, you know, every time you criticize or, or on factual basis, you talk about Israel, you know, it's like anti-Semitic. So, but what is Semitic? I mean, uh, and they've done, you know, genetic tests. Maybe you can just uh, elaborate on that um, a little bit. Well, the, the study you're referring to was out of John Hopkins University. That was the first study. There have been three others since then, and they all concur that the Ashkenazi Jews who claim um, ownership or a right to ownership for the area we know as Palestine uh, have no Semitic blood in them. 
And so their, their defense that they use of that, oh, that's an anti-Semitic comment. You're an anti-Semitic person. You have anti-Semitic views. That's BS. It, 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 it's false. It, it's a lie, like everything else that they tell, uh, which is mostly lies. So um, that's really where we're where, where that uh, ends up, because if, if how can they claim to be Semitic? How can you be anti-Semitic um, if you have none of that blood in you? So they're, they're really hiding behind things. And they use this story about the Holocaust as well as uh, to, to buy themselves blameless. They have the right to self-defense. Well, what they're doing in uh, Israel and Palestine right now is well beyond self-defense. Uh, that's uh, they're, they, they've they have been and continue to be the oppressors of the Palestinian people. Um, no one invited them to uh, move in Palestine and take over. Uh, the, certainly, the indigenous people there, the Semites who actually lived there, the Palestinian people, uh, didn't invite them. They were just moved in with the permission of the British, who had the protectorate at the time, 1947. They signed that over in the Balfour Agreement. Uh, which, you know, uh, let, let's take a little history lesson here. Um, Britain was losing the First World War against Germany. They were losing badly. And uh, the, the, the Brits went and said, what are we going to do? We're, we're losing. And so the Zionist Jews said to them, say, look, if uh, you can get, I uh, said, so we can get the, uh, the United States involved in this, and that will swing the war in your favor. But if we're going to do that, you have to give us Palestine. And that's where this uh, the infamous Balfour Agreement came from, which gave the rights to Palestine, which Britain, Britain didn't own to give away, but uh, they, they assigned away something that they didn't own to a fraud, and they gave away land that didn't belong to them, which was Palestine. Right. Exactly. And that was it the Rothschilds that were backing the Balfour Declaration? I mean, it was actually on record, I think, you said that. Yes. And so um, the British gave away something fraudulently that they didn't own without the consent of the indigenous people living in the area, living in the jurisdiction. Uh, it, it was really um, a, a bad deal all around for the Palestinian people. And what I'm seeing now with what the Palestinians are doing is they're reacting to uh, 75 years of oppression. And it, it's pretty obvious that the Israelis have no intention of accommodating the Palestinians at all, um, that they intend to uh, continue with their genocide of the Palestinians and continue to push them off of their ancestral lands until all of uh, Palestine has been consumed by what we call the Zionist entity that we call Israel. Mm -hmm. um, now, before we go on, uh, Mike, th is there a background noise? I mean, is it, do you have a dog? Yeah, there, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there is. I've got two new puppies. And to keep them quiet, I put them in their kennel and gave them uh, something to chew on. Oh, that's what that's what the noise you hear. Yeah, no problem. Head. I can still hear you clearly. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me let me let me let me get back to what I was going to say. So, um, um, you know, um, Netanyahu. I mean, the guy is also just another puppet for me. And uh, you know, it's always good to you know zoom zoom out and and see like who's funding it. And who's controlling, you know, the money, who's controlling the ledger, who are in charge, you know, um, of the central bank or the central bank of the central banks. And not only the Rothschilds, you know, it's like the city of London and this and that. But um, is there, because I know you, you have a vast knowledge about this too. I mean, do you want to go into this, especially in connection with the financial uh, catastrophe that is unfolding in front of our eyes, you know, with the bond market, with the bond, uh, with a debt bubble, <laughs> um, do you want to like connect the dots maybe uh, or do, do you want well, to do this later um, you, you bring up a good point here what people need to understand about the city of London is that um, King I think it was King Charles of Britain expelled all the Jew bankers from England threw them out, threw them out. they were gone for you know 30-40 years and then they hired a guy named Oliver Cromwell to come in and topple that regime, which they did. And then they installed the uh, the, the current lineage of, uh, of British kings uh, in there. And so the, the Jew bankers did that. And that is how the city of London became established. The city of London, like the Vatican, like Washington, D.C., 
is a discrete and separate area from the rest of the, you know, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, England, if you will. Just like Washington, D.C. is separate from the United States. It's its own sovereign territory. Like the Vatican is separate from Rome and from Italy. It's a separate territory. It has its own um, uh, diplomatic credentials, if you will. Yeah, and for example, like Prince Charles or, or the former queen, uh, they didn't have like a permission to just enter the city of London as far as I know, right? I mean, they, right? She, she has to seek uh, yeah. uh, permission from the Lord Mayor of the city of London, and they force her to take her shoes off uh, when she when she comes in, which is a, you know a humiliation, if you ask me. But uh, yeah, they, they really control the shots, and uh, the, a very wise man by the name of Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, who used to uh, be the uh, government or the governor, if you will, president of uh, Libya, said that if you wanted to end all terrorism in 24 hours, you need to nuke the city of London. <laughs> and, so, uh, truer <laughs> words were never spoken. I mean, he gets it. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's where it is. I mean, you look at how these bankers, uh, the Rothschilds in particular, have played people uh, through lies, through deceit, deception, bribery, blackmail, murder. You know, let's go back to the Napoleonic Wars. When uh, um, Napoleon was fighting uh, the Battle of Waterloo, uh, the Rothschilds came back. Um, they had a messenger come in and say, Napoleon has won, all is lost. So Rothschild was sitting back and um, everybody was dumping all their stocks and their and their bonds, everything had pennies on the dollar, trying to get out and salvage what they could. Rothschild came in and bought them all up. And then the real messenger arrived and said, "Victory is ours. We have won." But uh, so they they committed a fraud against the investor class and the royal uh, the, uh, aristocratic uh, class of England of, of the UK, and had uh, defrauded them out of their legitimately held holdings and they I don't know why they couldn't claw them back because fraud vitiates all contracts so uh, but somehow they didn't and that's how Rothschild made uh, a great deal of uh, their immense wealth that they have today uh, even to this day I should say but by that that's how these people are they're they're liars they're they're cheats they're frauds uh, they'll do anything they can to to get a dollar or you know a dollar a pound i don't, I don't care what the, what what the denomination it's in but they, they'll do anything to gain more material wealth let me speak you know uh, yeah. in broader terms on that point mike i mean uh you know the rothschild that's sort of a front for me is still a front face for a really you know background empire um they're allegedly you know it doesn't really matter whether it's tens of hundreds of trillions but are there other groups or oligarchies, you know, small, you know, number of people like, I don't know whether, whether they call them black nobility or Venetian, I don't know, oligarchies. I mean, are there other people who, who, who uh, whose faces we haven't seen yet besides the Rothschild? Well, uh, the answer is yes and yes. And uh, determining who that accurately is, is always the hard part. Um, you know, here's what I see. I see these, uh, the global banking interest. They don't make business plans like you or I would. Um, in US business schools, we're taught to think in the five-year plan. You make a five-year plan, you revise it annually to adjust it, but you still make your goals. These people are thinking in 100-year, 500-year plans. They're thinking well beyond what any human can think like because a five-year plan, that's a long time to hold a plan because what you launch on day one and we end up on the end of the last day on the fifth year can look very different. That's why you have to adjust your business plans constantly. But these people are thinking in 500-year plans. And so it's, it's, is that really human thinking that can think in such a time frame? Because you know, we're, we're born, we live, we die 75, 80 years, you know, 85 if, if we're lucky, you know, so a few people live, you know, 90 and 100, but very few, uh, most humans don't. So you, you take the first 18 years out because that's when you're growing up and getting educated. So you've got from the time you're 18 to you're 65 at retirement age or too old to work, and you, you've got a, you know, 47 year window in there to accomplish things. Um, people don't think in terms that are, that that's 10 times that, you know, so, um, you know, what, what, how are they getting their minds around a 500 year plan? Unless there, there's obviously something we're not seeing. And this is what uh, Preston James and myself have referred to as 
the third force, the hidden hand that shapes and manipulates human events. And I think what we're seeing right now is that hidden hand manipulating human events on a global scale right now, real time, but we're seeing it. It's very interesting, very interesting. Let me uh, go back to, because uh, it really intrigues me and shocks me. Um, um, I want to go back to Israel and, you know, the, the whole Hamas thing. I mean, I mean, Netanyahu was on the record saying, you know, Israel, I don't know when that was, maybe a few, a couple of years ago, he said Israel should uh, like fund or support Hamas in order to whatever, uh, you know, execute, a, you know, specific. Uh, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Let me fill in for you a little bit. See, Israel was very threatened by Yasser Arafat and the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. The PLO was the power. Well, um, Israel funded Hamas to get started to offset the power and influence that, that Arafat had. So they, they, they started, they funded it, they, they put their hand-picked people in there to guide it initially. And now, I can't say for real, but it seems to have taken on a life of its own where the Israelis no longer have the control they once had. Over. I don't know. I think these things run deep, but anything that Israel has ever touched I don't trust them, and so uh, I, I really do not. I, I I'm questioned on this, but they wanted to destroy Arafat. They wanted to destroy the PLO, right. so they replaced it with Hamas. Uh, that was the logical thing for them to do: give them a more friendly adversary, but an adversary nonetheless, something for the uh, the Palestinian people to to go to and, and support, because they they wanted to uh, pull uh, Arafat's teeth, if you will, because he was too effective. Mm -hmm. I see. So. According to your assessment, Mike, do you think they let it happen? Because there's a lot of, you know, uh, opinions and, you know, they have like Israel has like, you know, highest degree of, I don't know, advanced uh, surveillance technology, defense technology, allegedly. I mean, I don't know. But is it true? Did, do you think they let it happen? And if it if it wasn't a false flag, which I don't think, but did they just let it happen? Because, uh, you know, the whole defense system and how could that happen? I mean, uh, you know, at, at one time in my life, I was an officer with a ISR company. And ISR stands for Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. And that's everything from uh, drones in the sky to aerostats to uh, airships, satellite surveillance, all surveillance of every sort. And what you do is you, you form a, a picture of what the theater of battle looks like. And yeah, I, I'm pretty acquainted with what the state of the art in that is, that is now. And for Israel to say they were taken by surprise, it's sort of like the United States saying they were taken by surprise by 9-11. It's, it's bull. It's, it's, it's a, it's a bold-faced lie. They're trying to buy themselves some covering and uh, say, oh, whoops, oh, gee, we didn't see that coming. When you know that not only did they see it coming, they were probably in it. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot there that uh, could be discussed you know, relative to both those issues. But the technology as it exists, as, as Israel claims they have, which I believe they do, uh, there's no way that this could have happened in a vacuum without them knowing about it. And in fact, there's no way anything could have gotten into Gaza. We're hearing about weapons from Ukraine ending up in Gaza. We're hearing about weapons from Afghanistan that the U.S. supplied ending up in Gaza. Um, the Israelis keep a really close eye on everything. And so any of your transport uh, corridors, your shipping lanes, your trucking lanes, your rail, the Israelis have got their nose in everything. I mean, they, they leave no uh, stone unturned. And so for, for them to sit back and expect us to believe that they were taken by supply, surprise, it's really sort of a stretch of the imagination. Even if I trusted them, uh, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd have to scratch my head and say, well, do I really trust them? Do I really believe them? I don't think so. Uh, but as it is, they're telling us that they were surprised. I don't believe a word the Israeli said. I think they were in on it. I think that Bibi Netanyahu is in such deep political trouble that uh, they're ready to hang him. And I think that he probably authorized this in order to unite the Israeli people behind an enemy um that that he was going to lead and save them from exactly yeah and 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 to be honest with you, i mean i gotta emphasize this is the most convenient time for him i mean wasn't he under uh for, uh what do you call it prosecution uh, wasn't he prosecuted for fraud yes. for corruption uh, all, all, all sorts of things i mean he's he's in in deep water he's in he's in hot water he's in in trouble 
and they're trying to get rid of him. He wants to change the judicial system. <clears throat> you know, for, for weeks now, months, they, they've had a million people marching in the streets of Israel saying, no, we don't want this change. Exactly. And, and he's been trying to force that change. And so, you know, he knows his days are numbered. He knows that if he had to stand trial in an honest court, that he would probably be hung. And so he had everything to gain. Now, this is just conjecture on my, my part. I'm, I'm just giving you my best guess. But, you know, it, it seems like he is the, ask yourself two questions. Who benefits? Why now? Right. Now, Bibi Netanyahu is the big beneficiary, anyone who's affiliated and associated with him. And why now is because uh, he was losing his power, losing his grip and power. And once he did that, he's in a jail cell. They're going to hang him because he's done some incredibly horrendous things where treason uh, against the Israeli people and treasons against uh, all of his allies and friends. So uh, he, he's out of uh, things uh, to deal with here. Oh, and by the way, I mean, talking about the experimental vac uh, vaccines or injections. For uh, that forcing people, that. Oh, forcing my God. That. Jesus Christ. I mean, this is this is beyond criminality, Mike. I mean, well, it's it's uh, to a point where you look at it and it's anti-human. You no, know, you, you have to look at uh, this whole talk about the, the WEF and the depopulation agenda, mm -hmm. where they want to get rid of 90% of the, uh, the population on the world. Now, that's not my words. Those are their words. I know. It's a hard pill to swallow, Mike. I think I got to say this for, the, for our listeners. A lot of things that you're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, I think it's really hard to swallow. Whether it be the systemic pedophilia, extortion, you know, the Epstein thing, it's just a, it's just a sideshow, I think, always been a sideshow. But I think it's been ongoing with multi-intelligence, uh, multi, you know, I mean, maybe you want to tie this in, the whole, you know, pedophilia, extortion, blackmail uh, thing going on in the background? Well, here's where I'm limited. You know, I don't have any first-hand experience with any of that. You know, I mean, I, I don't know anything about pedophilia. I'm, I'm not a pedophile. They have their own network. No, no, but their, I mean, there's their, enough no, investigative no, no, books and reports so like for, from no, Whitney no, Webb, you know, uh, One Nation on the Blackmail. If you've read it, I mean, it's 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 all out there in the open, what I'm saying. Well, that, that's the thing. Like I said, I don't have any experience there. All I have is other people's accounts of what happened. And so uh, what in a court of law is going to be called hearsay. So all I, all I have to rely on on this is the hearsay. But I look at Epstein Island and what was going on there with young girls, you know, 14, 15, 16 year old, young, attractive women. They're bringing in, you know, uh, wealthy politicians, businessmen, you know, heads of state, all of this. And they're, they're allowing them to have their way with these young, pretty girls. And then it's all filmed on, on tape and blackmail. And I, I look at this and I see, well, some funny things have happened. You know, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was in a secure U.S. prison and somehow he was found hung. Uh, and uh, the cameras were conveniently turned off in his cell. And, you know, the guard fell asleep. Nobody checked on him. And uh, lo and behold, he's dead. And the other thing is, uh, with this Ghislaine Maxwell, who is his, uh, his uh, accomplice on this, is that they've never revealed who was on that list. They try to keep it hidden. And so, well, who are they protecting? You know, why not? If, if these people are dirty people and bad people who've been blackmailed into doing somebody else's will um, against their own will, uh, why not reveal them? And, well, the reason is, well, because now we own them. <laughs> you know, you, you're, you may have been being blackmailed by the Epstein organization, but now my organization has them and now we're going to blackmail you you know, do what we say, or we're going to re you know, reveal the facts about you. And so that, that's a valuable commodity where you can take these heads of states, heads of corporations, uh, you know, uh, famous people, uh, actors, movie stars, whatever, and if you can make them do things against their will that you want them to do, that's very powerful. And so that's the real reason why we've not seen um, the, uh, the guest list of, uh, of Epstein Island, uh, I, I suppose. But uh, th these are the things that we deal with. And, you know, I, I hear the discussions about pedophilia. I hear the discussions about ad adrenochrome, all this type of stuff. Now, adrenochrome is a real substance. Uh, what it does, I couldn't tell you. I've never uh, experienced it myself. I don't, don't have any clue. 
No, what 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 they're saying is, I mean, you can actually even to a certain degree, I think you can create it artificially, but because uh, they're they're extracting it, I mean, I gotta just say they're extracting, they they are torturing children, and then because of the torture, they are. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, releasing some kind of hormones, or I don't train. Uh, tr the adrenaline goes through the roof, and probably other other hormones and uh, yeah, as well other uh, uh, psychotropic compounds within the human body uh, go on. But like I said, you know, I, I don't have any experience. So, like I said, again, if this is hearsay on my part. I can't speak with authority on this. But in the U.S., before this all happened, we had eighty thousand kids a year just disappearing. And uh, I look at what's going on at our Mexican border, all these young children being brought across the border, they're disappearing. And I look at Ukraine, now Ukraine has been, they've been harvesting women and children out of Ukraine for decades now. And, uh, you know, uh, every brothel in uh, Israel is filled up with young, pretty Ukrainian girls who are promised a wonderful job overseas, were kidnapped, their passports destroyed, and uh, they, they prostitute them out until they're dead. And then they harvest their organs and sell those on the black market. And so that, that's what's been going on there for a long time. But since this war in Ukraine, um, the, the Israelis have been in there are, uh, organ harvesting. Uh, the, you have young men, 18, 20 years old. Hey, you know, anybody needs a new liver? Anybody needs a new heart? Anybody needs new corneas? Whatever the part is, you put in your order, we'll find it for you. And, and that's what they've been doing. And you, know, you have to look at Ukraine as being the money laundering center of the world. It was one of the drug trafficking hubs, definitely the human trafficking hub, the sex trafficking hub, the child uh, trafficking hub, the organ um, trafficking hub of the world, and then money laundry that they can clean it and wash it all back. You know, you, you look at the, the list that was published of, of all the U.S. politicians who have gotten kickbacks out of the money the U.S. is sending to Ukraine for military aid. It's, it's, uh, it's sickening. You know, and so we, we've got problems here in the U.S. With, with our government, we have problems. Yeah, I just thought we need to uh, we need to uh, mention this uh, aspect because um, it ties all in into the whole, you know, um, oligarchy, Kazari mafia, uh, multi intelligence agencies. Uh, anyway, um, so Mike, um, let's go back to Israel. Um, I mean, if, if this is so insane, you know, what I find really shocking is like people like, I mean, I'm not a fan of Jordan Peterson or Ben Shapiro, but like crawling, you know, into the ass of Netanyahu and, you know, a prop, uh, you know, advocating for literally ethnic cleansing and, and not talking about, you know, the innocent civilians, the children. Uh, uh, what is going on? I mean, are they trying really to lure or to provoke a war with Iran? I mean, this is not like 40 years ago, you know, I mean. Uh, with Iran, Iran has like like the most at one of the most advanced, uh, at least you know, conventional military technologies, rockets, missiles, and they don't even need nuclear missiles. And I'm not a friend, you know, of the Iranian regime. I just want to, you know, a caveat. Just, <laughs> just want to say that. But I, I, I mean, what kind of insanity is going on? I mean, are they trying to provoke a World War Three or a total, you know, disaster on in the Middle East? Well, here's what's going on. Um with American Jews, okay? Um, many of these American Jews are dual Israeli citizens, all right? So they have US citizenship, they have Israeli citizenship. What that does is that it means they're not true Americans. You know, they may have been born here, they may have a US passport, but they also have the Israeli passport. So they will react irrationally when it comes to the defense of Israel. Me, I'm a real American, my, my family, I've got records in my possession that my family has lived in the same place for seven years. I was the seventh generation. Now there's two generations behind me. So nine generations of, of an American. Can you hang on a second? Let me uh, stop this noise behind me. I'm going to mute this mic. I'll be right back. Okay. Well, hopefully that will quiet them down here. If not, I'll, I'll, no I'll let you know. I used to have dogs myself. Yeah. <laughs> but um, anyway, what, what, what Ben Shapiro, Mark uh, Levin, and others have revealed to us is that their primary loyalty is not to the United States. It is to Israel and it's to their people. It's not to America and the American people. And so that is a, a big reveal. And in, in fact, they've done us a favor by coming out with their extremist support for Israel because this guy, Mark Levin, very famous, the guy is on Fox News often. 
and he wants to have Israel use their entire nuclear arsenal to uh, destroy the Arab states around him. Um, that is would mean the end of the United States. Uh, we would be facing a jihad like no other uh, if, if Israel did that, because they hold us accountable for Israel. Um, we're not accountable for Israel. The United States um, misguidedly supports Israel. And the reason for that is there are so many wealthy Jews in the U.S. who buy influence with our Congress and with our Senate and with our politicians across the board from, 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 from the city council uh, all the way up to uh, um, the president of the United States. And so they have they have bought their way in. Well, that's the one thing about giving a bribe. You give the guy a bribe, and he accepts it. Now you own him because you can blackmail him further in the future, saying, "Look, I got the records and the bribe. You're going to do what I tell you, or I'm going to out you. You're going to have to go to jail for this." And so once they take the bribe, they're owned. And you know, in the U.S., um, there's a, a, a committee called uh, the American Israeli Political Action Committee. And they are the, one of the worst because they make every new congressman sign a pledge of loyalty to Israel. Uh -huh. It's contradictory to their constitutional oath that they swear that they're going to uphold to the Constitution of the United States and put that first and foremost. So there, there's a conflict here, but, but the, the wealthy Jewish Americans have enabled Israel to... Uh, uh, to, to be subsidized by us. They, they put pressure on congressmen. Well, look, I'll, I'll make a nice uh, campaign donation to you if you vote for this bill to uh, up right. Israel uh, you know, subsidy for military aid. Yeah. So, and when you're talking about like Jewish, like I think we have to emphasize he said Zionist Jewish. As Joe Biden once said, you don't need to be a Jew to be a Zionist. You know what I'm saying? It's like... Um, well, it, it's, it, that, that is true. Uh, Zionism is bigger than Judaism. And Judaism is bigger than Zionism. They, they have a lot in common, but there are boundaries out there that uh, Zionism exceeds. There, there are uh, Christian Zionists out there, which are among the worst, if you will. And there are uh, Jews who are not Zionists. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a difficult way to, to say, I mean, how do you know who the good guys are and the bad guys are? Exactly. And, and so, you know, there, there's a problem. That, that my, my trouble with Judaism is that uh, the way it's taught in the U.S., the way people that I interact with in the U.S., is they seem to be a culture based on deceit. And um, as a you know, Caucasian American, I, I'm not much of a Christian. I, I guess I'm not the most religious guy. Mm -hmm. But uh, as a you know, Caucasian American Christian, we're taught to value honesty, candor, forthrightness. Whereas, uh, you know, you look at the Mossad uh, um Motto says uh, war by way of deception, <laughs> and it, it, it permeates every aspect of their culture. I mean, I have done you know, business with uh, various Jews in the past, and um, I've had Jewish lawyers. Every one of them has billed me for hours that never worked. And uh, you know, I, if you go into the Jewish deli, you got to watch the guy so he doesn't put his thumb on the scale and try to cheat you out of uh, two slices of uh, corned beef or something. You really got to watch them. It, it, it's a tough way to go, but but that, that just seems to be prevalent in, in their culture. And their culture is separate from the, uh, the from the American culture. Uh, they're, they're integrating into it somewhat, but it's separate. Hang on, I, I got noisemakers behind me. I've got to deal with this. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, I just want to say a couple of things. Uh, I think it was Abby Martin. I mean, I, I, I think she's one of the really best investigative journalists when it comes to Israel, Palestine. She said, um, I think it was 30 or 30, 33 U.S. states had to sign an agreement or some kind of papers that said, you know, hey, if you want to have this and this funding, you cannot criticize Israel. You always have to like be in support of Israel, of you know, Zionism. And then the other thing is, um, you never see there are like at least hundreds of thousands of Torah, I, I call them, you know, the members of the Torah Judaism, who protest, who demonstrate against, uh, you know, Zionism, the Zionistic Jew, uh, Jew, Jewish state, Israel. But we never see that on mainstream. Why is that? I mean, uh, would that be United States or other countries, even Iran, you know, I mean, they live peacefully, you know, uh, the Orthodox, I call them, or Torah Judaism. Well, you, you look at uh, the simple answer as you, why is it never discussed? You look at who controls the media 
and, and the U.S. and who controls the media globally. Um, you know, back in the Reagan era, before he deregulated telecom, we had 156 television and radio networks coast to coast in the United States. Some of them were small, regional, maybe a, a two or three states, maybe half of a state, depending on the state it was in, but there was 156 of them. Now, after Reagan deregulated that to bring us more choices, cheaper cost, better content, just a better deal for the consumer, now we only have six. And uh, those six are all Jewish controlled and they all operate as a cartel uh, where they they have the same talking points, the same lines, you know, they, they, they speak off the same narrative every day. And I don't care if it's one that pretends to be uh, liberal like MSNBC or pretends to be conservative like Fox News, they all say the same thing, the same talking points on a daily basis. It's like, where did they get their script from? And uh, it's, it's too well coordinated to have been anything but coordinated. Uh, it's so it, you know, I mean, it, it's like a marching band. They're all marching in step. They turn left, they turn right. They, they, they know what they're doing. They know where they're going. And that's how our media conducts itself in this country these days. Yeah. And then on top of that, you have the CIA or, you know, Operation Mockingbird. I mean, it's, you know, the whole intelligence have been all in control of, you know, mainstream media. It's like reading from the teleprompter. It's, it's really scary, you know, whether it's be, you know, the COVID thing, the Corona thing, the vaccine stuff. It's, it's mind blowing, to be honest with you. I mean, <laughs> well, if, if you want to control a man's thinking, control the information he gets. And uh, the reference point I'm going to give on this is Harry Truman, uh, who was responsible for creating Israel, in fact. But he was being questioned uh, by reporters rather aggressively one day and says, you know, come on, President Truman, why would you flip flop on this? We thought you said X, Y and Z. Why did you why would you flip? Why did you go? Why did you do the opposite? He says, I have new information. And so if you can control the information that people get, you can control the choices of what decisions they make. And that's what's going on in the United States and has been going on since the, the murder of John F. Kennedy in broad daylight in uh, Daly Plaza in November of 1963, uh, that the CIA uh, made their move. Uh, Israel was involved in this. We know Ben-Gurion had a, a hand in it. And they, they took out a president, a sitting president in broad daylight, just to show the world they could do it, number one. And then number two, to keep every other president since then un under control. And they've been successful at it so far up until Trump. Uh, and he is still out there. I, you know, I, I favor Trump, but he, I'm not convinced yet that he's not. Yeah, because I would say I would, I would have I would have used the same words. Well, well, OK, what do you think? I mean, is he is he playing along to a certain degree? Because, the you know, even the things that he's taught, I mean, uh, did he achieve any? Had he achieved any? First of all, his election was stolen. I mean, is that, is that a fact or? That, in my opinion, that is a fact. I, I was watching Fox News that night uh, when the election returns came in back in 2020. And I, I was watching on my computer a guy named Greg Hunter. Uh, we were, and he used to be with one of the other networks. I was watching him and we were watching the coverage come in. And I look at Pennsylvania that had 93% of the vote in, Trump's ahead by 800,000 votes and they're not gonna call it for Trump. They, they, they held up. Arizona, my state, has 9% of the vote in, and Biden's barely ahead, and they call it for Biden. Uh, you know, trying to manipulate and interfere in the election real time, and trying to convince people that Biden actually won. Well, I am convinced that there was meddling in that. I mean, you know, I, I um, served as the finance chairman for the Republican Party in 1994. So one thing I will tell people is that there isn't a two-party system in the U.S. because the top 10 donors to the Democrats are the same top 10 donors to Republicans. You know, so the, the donors call the shots, or whether you like it or not. That's why you send a new guy to Washington and nothing ever changes. It's always the same, same, same way, same way of doing business. That's why. I also ran for governor in 2006, and I know how hard it is to go out there and even get on the ballot. But I was on the damn ballot. I made it. But I, 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 I got, I got clobbered. But uh, <laughs> um, I, I see how it is, and I, I know how these things work 
from an insider view. But before that, I served as a, a precinct committeeman and as a precinct committee uh, captain. And that's the grassroots level. That, that's where you go knocking on doors and say, hey, there's an election that next Tuesday. Here's a list of candidates uh, that I'd like you to consider uh, that are going to be affecting our area. Every, everybody from the dog catcher uh, to the governor uh, in, in, in the state level. And uh, so I, I've done this work. I, I know what it is. I know what it, what it entails. And yes, sir, that election was stolen. And the fact that they use these um, electronic voting machines. Uh, yeah. The, those, yeah. All right. Now, back in 2012, I did an interview on Russia Today. And I said the electronic voting machines are no different than the slot machines in Las Vegas, the gambling machines. And what the Las Vegas casinos will do, if it's Friday night and it's 7 o'clock and it's kind of slow, They'll dial up the payouts. They'll kick it up 25% more. So the, every machine's paying out more often. You know, oh, I won, oh, I won, oh, I won. Next thing you know, every fourth or fifth person is winning on, on a regular basis. Oh, this is great. Everybody puts more money in and they, they take. But by the time the, the evening slows down, 11, 30, 12 o'clock, they dial it back, they dial it back, they dial it back. And then they, they make their profit for the night at that time. They got back all the money they let out. And they, they get back the extra money because, well, I was on a lucky strip. I want my lucky strip back. They keep putting, you know, quarters or dollars back in that machine a, until they think they're going to win or until they're broke. And so that's that's how the, the software manipulation, these, these voting machines can be told who's going to win, what precinct, and, and by how much. And they'll, they'll give you the result they want. It, it, it's programming. It's simple. It, it's not hard. And how anybody can be so foolish enough not to see this amazes me. This is why in the United States for election integrity, we need paper ballots, hand count, and we need positive ID at the polling place where the person voting is really the person who's casting the ballot. So you have to show them some photo ID. Now, the, the Democrats come out and say, well, that's racist. And say, well, wait a minute. These black people can go buy liquor. They can drive cars. Uh, they, they can, you know, do anything else that they need an ID for. Um, you know, how come they can't get an ID to vote? That's 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 a lie. It's a, that's a bullshit story that they're, they're trying to get us to believe when it, it's absolutely not true. I mean, if, if you'd uh, ask any black person, say, hey, you got a driver's license? Well, yeah, of course I do. Why wouldn't I? You know, unless they got out of prison or got drunk driving or something. But, you know, that's, that goes for any race, whether you're Asian or white or whatever. But, uh, you know, there it, it, it's yeah. a con. And the, the Democrats use these emotional arguments to tell lies. And, and a lot of people, well, okay, I can understand that. That poor black woman, she's so incapable that she can't get a driver's license. She, she couldn't drive. It's, 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 it's bull. I mean, black people are extremely capable. Ask them, they'll tell you. <laughs> It's all interconnected. My, um, let me because I think the listeners. I think um, it all ties in. Let me, let me, okay, um, Donald Trump. Um, you know he he signed. He had signed a, a bunch of executive orders, and there is this talk about that. You know, uh, Donald Trump is still the acting wartime president. I mean, do you want to talk about like the continuity? I mean, is there is there any relevance to that, or uh, is he no. playing for D chess? Uh, what is he playing? In, in a word, I don't know. I, I do not know. Would I, would I like to dream that he is still the commander in chief or the wartime uh, commander in chief because of these executive orders? Uh, yeah, I would. But I haven't seen the Insurrection Act signed and I haven't seen anything uh, positive on, on hissing. And that takes me back to all this Q information. And I think Q uh, was a psyop to keep Americans sitting on their sofas mm -hmm. and not getting up and doing something active themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easier to say, well, trust the plan. Q's got this. Well, the, the, the good guy, the White House are in control. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it keeps people uh, placated while they're while the news gets tighter around their neck. Okay, what about what about the, the weaponization of the justice system against Donald Trump? I mean, this is very convenient to, for one and for the other. I mean, could that be the reason, you know, to uh, stop him, you know, for a re-election or... Uh... Well, it's pretty obvious that they're using the Justice Department and other uh, Soros-assisted um, uh, prosecuting attorneys, uh, district attorneys in, in various jurisdictions to harass Donald Trump and trying to disparage him publicly. 
but he's been very good so far. Uh, nothing, none of the charges that they've leveled against him for anything have stuck in any way. Uh, so either this is the, the cleanest Boy Scout that ever lived, or he's got a really excellent machine of his own. But what, what's happened here in the U.S. is that the people of the United States, your vote doesn't count. Um, you know, you, you think you're voting, you think you're having an impact, but you're really not. Um, you you think you are. Essentially, the United States has devolved into an oligarchy, where if you have enough money, you can buy enough influence, you can get things done your way. Um, you know, then you've got you know fifty competing oligarchs trying to shape it their way. That that's that's really what's going on in this country, where the, the voice of the people, the run of the mill person, this constitutional democracy uh, republic that that we live in, this dem constitutional democratic republic, to speak accurately that we live in is no more than an illusion because the permanent bureaucrats, uh, the people who are in the senior executive service, have more influence over that than any elected official does. It's not a matter of having the laws, it's how you choose to enforce the laws. And with Donald Trump, they're being very aggressive in enforcement. With Hunter Biden, not so much. Uh, he's sort of getting a free pass. And uh, the only charges that have been brought against Hunter Biden so far, when he's probably got over 100 felonies he's committed on that laptop that there's hard proof of. The only charges they brought against him are ones that don't touch his father or don't implicate his father in any way. Yeah, and, and so, it, they should have actually registered at foreign agents, by the way. I mean, this is treason, what they're picking up, you know. Absolutely, it, it's been treason. You know, I mean, yeah. on my trips to Syria, we had to be very careful about what we said because we didn't want to cross that line mm -hmm. and be acting under the Hatch Act uh, usurping any of the authority of the executive branch. We had to be very careful with that. Uh, we, we could make generalized statements, but we couldn't make commitments on behalf of the U.S. government. And uh, Hunter Biden's clearly acting as a foreign agent uh, for Burisma, for China, uh, and who knows who else, others. Right. But uh, he, he didn't do this because it would have complicated his father's election prospects. And uh, Joe Biden might not have... Uh, um, been appointed or you know, been been put in that office if uh, more people had voted uh, or had not voted for him of the legitimate votes that he did get. I mean, th this is really, it's an ugly situation here in the U.S. And my greatest fear is that we're going to come down to um, street fighting, that, that's going to break out into a yeah. civil type war. And that is a legitimate fear. Uh, we have so many things going wrong in this country. You look at this uh, this looting of uh, department stores and Circle K's and things where the blacks are coming in, and you know, fifty of them will come in and just, you know, like a plague of locusts, just strip the, the shelves bare. You know, that that's not good. That's not healthy. And as this economy in the U.S. gets worse and worse because of higher interest rates, you know, you're killing small business. The COVID thing killed small business. They allowed big box stores to stay open. They allowed chain restaurants. If you were Giuseppe's Pizzeria, you had to close. But if you were the Olive Garden Italian food, you could stay open. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so they, they really, it was really carefully crafted to put the small businesses out of business and to bankrupt them, which they did. And that left a lot of people unemployed, costing their life savings. Your productive businesses are no longer productive, but it does, it concentrates more and more wealth into fewer and fewer hands. So now when you want to take your wife, your girlfriend out to dinner, you can't take it to Giuseppe's uh, anymore because he's closed. Now you have to take it to Olive Garden if she wants Italian food, there's, there's no other choice. And uh, the, the United States is being slowly turned into what the Soviet Union was in the communist era. Yeah. Where uh, you want a TV, we have one brand. You want a car, we have one brand. Uh, where they've eliminated all competition. And that's what's happening in the U.S., except now we have five uh, different, six different media companies. We're down to three, four different airlines. Uh, you were, we're consolidating all of uh, U.S. business and commerce into a uh, smaller and smaller set of hands. With, with every every decade that uh, that the change is noticeable, take right. about a decade. Right. Um, Mike, I mean, uh, if we zoom out a little bit. I mean, let's talk a little bit monetary financial system. I mean, I mean, the U.S. dollar is still the international reserve currency. Uh, the United States has just added, uh, I think, a half a trillion dollars within two weeks. Uh, interesting. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling if you just look at the S curvature. 
Um, I mean, the, the global debt uh, is, I think, without unfunded liabilities and uh, whatever and derivative derivatives, is like 307, 300, something like that, $307 trillion. And if you add all the unfunded liabilities and derivatives, I think you come like to, to a, I mean, <laughs> it takes forward with the number of 2.1 quadrillion. Anyway, um, I mean, where, where do you see this going? With um, Because I think the most important question, that's why I'm a huge advocate and fan of Bitcoin, because it's the most really, it's it's a one and only decentralized, uh, immutable, uh, with absolute scarcity, uh, uncontrollable. Uh, I mean, every property you can think of as money. Um, and that's a final question I want to ask. I mean, uh, maybe we can just rock pull the whole system. These all, all these criminals, these these satanists, <laughs> rock pull them by by introducing them or mass adopting Bitcoin. I mean, we don't need the whole population. We just need three, five, maybe ten, maybe best of all, fifteen percent of global population adopting Bitcoin. And we have the technologies now. I mean, have you had time to? You know, deep. You know, go deeper into Bitcoin. Or... Well, y y yes, I have. I think Bitcoin is a good option. However, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is still fiat. Why? Uh, it still has no backing behind it. That that is the the weakness of Bitcoin. It's like the U.S. dollar. Uh, there is no backing to it. What I'm hoping for is that the BRICS nations will come back with a gold back BRIC currency. Um, you know, maybe not redeemable, but at least gold backed. You know, um, I remember I was a kid in 1970 when Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. And uh, you didn't notice it much at first. But back then, uh, our coins, uh, the coinage in the U.S. system were still made out of silver. Uh, they had 90% silver content in a, in a quarter and a dime, you know, half dollar silver dollar. We, we still had that currency. Back then, as a kid, I made $1.60 an hour, okay? But I, if I had silver coins, a dollar sixty in silver coins today is worth about thirty-five bucks. You know, so uh, do the math. I mean, they've really, really uh, degraded our currency. And the part of the job, the biggest part of the job of the Federal Reserve, is to protect the value of the dollar. But again, another Jewish-run organization that has its own ends and its own means. And so when the uh, U.S. dollar was gold-backed in 1970, we were solid, $35 an ounce. There was, there was no inflation. You know, uh, things were affordable. You know, gas was, you know, 29 cents a gallon. For, right? Now it's, you know, in California, it's close to seven bucks. And so we, we've really uh, hurt our population by not having sound, stable money. Um, do I really think gold and, and silver are the best? Well, the old Rothschild has had uh, you know, decades and decades to accumulate as much gold at cheap prices as he could ever want. So even if we go to that, he's still going to make out like a bandit. So I, I really don't have, there, there are no easy answers here. Uh, like I said, I, I wish the BRICS uh, countries would come out with a, a gold-backed, uh, or at least a, a gold-affiliated, somehow you, you tie it to the value of gold um, uh, currency that people could actually trade in reliably because that's what's missing. I mean, if you want an economy to prosper, you need two things. You need sound money, and you need a stable tax uh, platform. And if you mess with either of those, you screw up your economy. And the U.S. has messed with both of those. And we have really screwed ourselves bad, really bad. And so uh, we, we've uh, listened to the bad advice that we've given by the financial experts, the bankers, the economists, you know, the, the Milton Friedmans, uh, the, those types, and uh, we really put ourselves in a deep hole. But you know, the good news for the people of the United States is we have no problems that we can't fix. We just have to have the political will to fix them and be free of interference from those who wish to hold us back. And that is the biggest problem we have is that interference from the small clique of uh, Jewish bankers who like their system and don't like anything other than their system. They're, their goal, I believe their end game is complete global domination. And they're making their moves right now towards that end. And I think that everything that's going on has been well coordinated uh, in order to uh, collapse the dollar, to convert us to a one world currency, 
It's going to be uh, an electronic uh, central bank. Uh, central bank digital currency. I mean, they want absolute control. This is what the uh, speaker, president of whatever, central of central banks, the Agustin Carson, you know, that that big man, you know, <laughs> said they want absolute control. So the, the question is, you know, which direction? And because you said, you know, sound money, I mean, I mean, there's one point I don't agree with you, but it's okay. I mean, because that would open a whole new, you know, um, uh, discussion, but actually bitcoin is the only money that is not fiat you know what i'm saying it's like uh we can say with mathematical precision right now what inflation rate bitcoin is going to have in 2025 2028 and then beyond that to zero so you know we're going to have a deflationary money and then we're going to have products and services better better technologies we're going to have more comfort more joy more pleasure and we're going to have cheaper prices, cheaper and cheaper prices. So um, I don't know. Do you do you see where I'm going with this? Um, I, I do. Like I said, I'm not adverse to the Bitcoin. I like the Bitcoin. I like the fact that I can, uh, you know, you give me your wallet. I can send you, you know, 500 bucks. It's there in an hour, you know, once it clears the, the blockchain. And uh, there, there's no other fees except uh, just a nominal fee to send it to you. Or lightning. And, I mean, within seconds, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it is, it, it takes, uh, it takes the banks out of it. Well, the banks want to stay in the game. The banks want to control the middle. They want to control the flow. So these are the adversaries that we have in going to a, a, a really free and true open market system. Now, I, I, I wish someone would come up with a, with a gold backed, uh, you know, uh, um, digital currency or crypto, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, something that, that has a tangible net worth to it because, if, if things get really bad, um, farmers around, they're going to want something tangible. You're not going to take my cow off my property unless I have something from you for it. Mm -hmm. Can you trade me, you know, uh, 500 pounds of corn? Can you trade me, uh, you know, 10 ounces of silver? Can you trade me you know, 100 uh, rounds for my rifle? You know, what do you have that I can use? As long as it's divisible, like, you know, to avoid the coincidence of once, you know, it needs, it has to be some properties that money has to have uh, amongst them, you know, transportability, portability, divisibility, hardness, scarcity, you know, like. <laughs> well, that, that is the one thing about the Bitcoin. It was, it was put with a cap. You can mm -hmm. never make any more. And once you, once you hit that cap, that's it. And, yeah, but uh, it's divisible. Every Bitcoin has 100 million Satoshi. You know what I'm saying? Well, I, I know, like, like I, I look at in, in my wallet now, I got like four zeros before I have a, a single digit. <laughs> you know, point zero, 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 zero. You know, uh, the, the value that it buys is much smaller. There, there was a time when I, when I had eight, nine, ten Bitcoins at a time in, in my wallet. Now it's fractions of a small fractions of a Bitcoin in there. But it, it is, it, it's um, infinitesimally divisible. Yeah. So it, it, but it does but it bitcoin serves the purpose of keeping the currency honest mm -hmm. exactly uh, Full currency, our currency in this country and in europe the euro as well these are corrupted currencies like i said they, they have no value the federal reserve you know prints willy-nilly right now i mean they they, they do what, what it is that they want Insane. they pretend to seek uh, congressional approval but what's going on on after hours in their their, their call windows and things? They're they're funding all these big banks that are too big to fail banks that that have shortages. I mean, right now, I mean, that people can't understand well enough how precarious the financial system is in the USA. I mean, um, the U.S. government is is not broke. They're thirty three and a half trillion dollars in debt, and that's on the books. Yeah. As you mentioned, Earlier, there's another 250, 300 trillion in unfunded government mandates that, that exist out there. Yeah. And you touched on the derivatives crisis out yes. there. Now, that doesn't affect the governments, but it affects all the, the, the too big to fail banks who've got quadrillions of dollars of exposure. Yeah. Out there. <laughs> so I mean, hey, it, it was a great ride on the way up when, when they're, they're writing these insurance policies and taking them. But if one of those big banks fails, they're all going to fail because they're all um, cross-reference in their derivatives holdings with each other, where they're insuring each other for losses. Well, if the counterparty can't pay, you don't get paid. Exactly. So um, they, they, they've really put themselves into a tight spot. I mean, personally, I, I, I would be happy to see the destruction of the global financial system down to the bone. Let us rebuild. Uh, let's go back through the days of barter and, and rebuild a working uh, financial system. 
that works for everybody and get rid of these uh, middle manager parasites exactly. that, that, that take a bite out you know, every step along the way. That's the other thing about Bitcoin that is so eloquent is that uh, you know the, if I'm going to send you money, there there's very little money lost in the transaction by the middlemen who are handling it. You know, if I if I was going to send you a wire transfer, my bank's going to take a fee. Exactly. Bank's going to take a fee. Bitcoin is direct. It's peer to peer. It's there's nobody in, in between. That's that's beautiful. You know, nobody can. You know, I can memorize twelve or twenty four words, go over the border, and people do that. They you know sell their stuff, put it into Bitcoin. I mean, theoretically or practically, you can literally you know memorize twelve or twenty four words, go over the border, and then you you have it. Voila, you know, <laughs> nobody can take it away from you. Um, yes, well, and you have uh, memory problems, but uh, that's a different story. Yeah, but it, you know, technically, I mean, technology it's 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 a unique thing, really. It's it's evolutionary money. So uh, I want to respect your time, and you know, it was amazing talk, um, Mike. Uh, thank you so much again. But do you want to like give like maybe connect the dots or or any perspective or vision you have, or maybe more holistic picture? Let me say this: uh, this week in particular. Everyone just pray for peace. Uh, the Israel-Palestine situation is awful. Um, the Palestinians are justified in, if, if they lash back at Israel, they're justified. They've had 75 years of just obnoxious abuse by the Israelis. And I want to remind people that this is not the first time that this Khazarian group has done this to a group of people. If you remember the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, where uh, the Bolsheviks, all Jews, went in to Russia and killed over the course of 70 years, 100 million Russian Christian men, women, and children. Just killed them. I mean, um, it took 70 years, but how many have been killed in Palestine? Now, this, this is the same pattern these people, uh, they repeat their pattern time and again. They did it in Russia, they took over, they ran for 70 years, they got run out, now they're in Israel. They got the second... Uh, chance there they overlapped a bit before the soviet union fell and but you know now most of the jews in uh in israel are many of them are, are from russia eastern europe where, where all this went went down and you'll notice that their projects tend to have about a 75 year life to them before they collapse and they have to, to flee and get out again so uh these are that's just a, an overview point of view but pray for peace i don't want to see anyone killed i don't want to see palestinians killed I, I don't want to see another Palestinian child blown up by a bomb. By the same token, I, I don't want to see the Israelis um, slaughtered either. They probably deserve it. They, they, they've earned it by their bad behavior. And um, if, if I was an Israeli right now, I would be advocating for everyone to throw yourself at the foot of your adversaries and beg for mercy, uh, beg for forgiveness, beg, beg. I mean, play the game. You say, if you want to live, you're going to ask your, 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 your Muslim adversary there to forgive you and to ask Allah for, for his forgiveness. Because that is the only eloquent way out of this is if, if they capitulate and bow down and, and ask the, the people they've offended to forgive them and uh, to, to promise to never do it again. But uh, that, that's really the only way otherwise the emotions of anger and rage and, and loss and hatred are going to take over. And if this is the scheme that could rage on for you know, 50, 100 more years. And no one wins that way. No one wins. But we have to realize when we're dealing with these people, the, these people are the apex parasitic predator on the planet Earth. They do it better than anybody else. Uh, they're responsible for so much hardship and heartache by so many people around the world. And they, for them, it's okay. They think it's all right to do these things. It's not all right. They, they, they've got to learn that lesson that uh, they they can't go in and mistreat people. And um, just, I mean, the, the Israeli soldiers, I'll never forget uh, the, the footage of them standing on hilltops, shooting uh, eight, 10, 12 year old Palestinian boys throwing rocks at a tank. Systematically, right? yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I mean, this, this, these are kids. They're throwing rocks at a tank. They're not going to hurt anything. Uh, you don't need to uh, practice your sniper skills on eight-year-old boys. And these things are unforgivable. I've seen them beat, you know, uh, Palestinian women. I've seen them beat old women. I've seen them beat men. Uh, you know, how you, you pick up, you know, a 12-year-old kid, you throw him in prison, you keep him there for six months a year. 
Uh, this is horrendous treatment. Um, if that was being done to the Israelis, um, they would have a different perspective on it. It's never been done to them. And um, you know, the, the closest that they say happened was during the Holocaust period. But well, I, I have my doubts about that because every story they tell us seems to be a lie. Yeah. And so when, when someone tells you lie after lie, you begin not to believe them anymore. And, and that's what uh, these, these uh, Jewish Zionists, the Khazari and Israeli types have done. They, they tell lie after lie after lie. And it, it's unfortunate, but they have created the situation for themselves. It's of their doing. It's their creation. And if they've got angry neighbors, then start being a better neighbor yourself. You know, maybe give back some of the of the land you've stolen from uh, the Palestinians. Maybe have a plan uh, to divide uh, the, the the territory more equitably, where you're not trying to squeeze them off of every square inch. Exactly, peacefully. Yeah, yeah. Start start giving back a little bit. Start being a better neighbor. I mean, treat them in the manner you would like to be treated. Yeah. Start being fair. Start being equitable. I mean, it's not about stealing and we're going to kill everybody who opposes us. That, that's yeah. how, that's what the Israeli uh, business model for government has been. Mm -hmm. It's just to kill everyone. And uh, it's, you know, to brutalize them, to terrorize them. And, you know, that's, that's, that's not what it is. They, they call the, the, the Palestinians terrorists. Well, you know, the real terrorists are the Israelis. They're the ones who blew up the King David Hotel. Uh, it wasn't the Palestinians. You know, it, it, was, it was the Israelis. And they have taken terror to a, an all-time high. And in my government, the U.S. government is, is in on this, too. And the problem we have in the U.S. is that our government is no longer a, a constitutional republic of we the people. Our votes don't count. We have no influence over our government. The donor class, the rich oligarch class has taken that over. Uh, the politicians respond only to money, but they've also done us a favor because now we can see the weaknesses in our uh, constitutional republic, and now we can strengthen those weaknesses so that uh, we can have a better government next uh, next iteration, next go round. But we we can't allow bribery and influence and uh, you know threats and intimidation to to our government officials. We have to have better quality people. Yeah, this has been going on too long, Mike. Too long. It's, it's been going on systematically, and it's, to be honest, it's it's beyond my world of comprehension. I mean, the pictures, the the you know the the footages that you see. I mean, uh, I can't see it anymore. It's it's. I mean, we have our we have a two two and a half year old daughter, and I'm like these children. They have no parents. Uh, you know, they've been heavily injured, or 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 you know, they just died, and uh, and. I don't know. I, I just I'm, I'm I'm sometimes really beyond words. I can't I can't I can't look at it anymore. It's so depressing and it's so beyond rationality and logic. And and uh, there is uh, there seems to be no willingness like to okay let's let's go and help the civilians. You know, let's go help the innocent people, the children. Uh, I mean, what what is going on? But anyway, it's it's thank you for the for your you know kind uh, in you know words of wisdom. Oh, but, but let's let's look at it. if you're an Israeli. And if by fighting, you know you're going to die. And by, you know, um, genuflecting in front of your adversary, you might live. Doesn't it make sense to bow down and, and give up and ask for forgiveness? Uh, Doesn't, I mean, the worst that's going to happen is the rage is so great, they're going to kill you anyway. But you might, you know, uh, get off. You, you might get, find some people who are willing to let you live if you can convince them that you're sincere in your, your ability. But I mean, the way I see it right now, Israel's going to get wiped off the map. And what I see happening, the biggest nightmare for, for me in the U.S. is, is that all the Jews that are in Israel are going to want to come to the United States as refugees. And uh, we don't need them. We don't want them. They're, 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 they're parasites. Uh, their, their whole way of life is, uh, is parasitical. And um, we need people who are contributors here, who build things, who make things, who, uh, you know, contribute. And, um, I just look at, I, I could spend, you know, hours talking about the problems this country has and how to solve it. But I, I just want to see this week in particular, let's get through this week. Let's don't have any um, blow ups. We, we need to get the United States out of the business of war. We're not very good at it. We, we, we lose a lot. We didn't win in Korea. We, we lost in, in Vietnam. We lost in Afghanistan. We lost in Iraq. You know, the United States sucks at this business, uh, but certain people, certain companies uh, make a lot of money. 
uh, by selling war materials. In the yeah, United we have uh, United States had like over 800 military <laughs> stations. Or well, not, not, not 900, 900 bases, 960 bases. Globally. We don't need that many. I mean, it's time for the United States to return back to the Fortress America doctrine, to where we become self-sufficient. We don't need global trade because we make and uh, use everything we make ourselves. We have enough oil, energy, gas here to last for generations. Uh, we have manufacturing technology well, that we need to re develop and redeploy. Um, we don't need global trade. Uh, we, we need to be standalone self-sufficient. Uh, that's the model that Putin is deploying in Russia and is working swimmingly for him. But uh, we need that as well. We've got two oceans on either side that make us a really hard target uh, to come into uh, for any sort of invasion, any sort of a land uh, battle. So we, if we left the world alone and, and sought peace, we might be able to survive this way, but going around and stirring up problems everywhere we go, um, we've become a, a hated country, a pariah, where you know people would rather lay down with, with lepers than uh, engage with the United States. And um, the, the big disconnect here is the American people were still believing the dream, you know, uh, that that we're we remember World War II, we're the good guys. We're here to save people. We're here to rush. We have not been a good guy in at least 50 years. We, we've been on the wrong side of everything. We're on the wrong side of history. Israel is not our best ally and friend. They are our most treacherous adversary ever because they, they convince you that they are a friend only to betray you. And the same thing with the United States. You know, um, Saddam Hussein was our friend. We betrayed him. And that they hunted him down until they found him. Uh, Daniel Noriega, the same thing uh, out of Panama. He was our friend, a strong man. You know, uh, we, we, same thing. They, they went down, they killed him. And this is what the U.S. does. They, they betray everyone. No one can trust the government of the United States. And the American people cannot trust this government because it has been compromised and corrupted by these Zionist Jews who have infiltrated our government. They do not uh, represent the people anymore. They represent their own interest, and uh, they've been using Bobby Fischer back in 1968, the chess champion. He came out and said that the Jewish people are criminal people, and they're using the United States to uh, achieve their goal of world domination. Uh, that was Bobby Fischer in 1968. Uh, that, that was his quote. It's a brilliant quote, and he's spot on. And the United States, we're, we're sending our young men and women to die, fight and die in far off places. For what? It doesn't benefit the American people at all. It doesn't benefit the American agenda. Uh, supporting Israel does not benefit the American people, it does not benefit the American agenda. You know, Afghanistan was a waste of time. In 20 years, you know, the CIA is over there cultivating the opium and distributing that worldwide. Well, the next thing you know, the U.S. has an opioid problem. Uh, th this, was, this was done internally. Our, our own government did that to our people. This government is, is uh, Jewish run. And you look at Biden's cabinet. I mean, find, find me that the non-Jew. Uh, they're, they're all uh, Jewish. And uh, the, these people don't care about us. They don't care about the American people, the ones who built this country. They, they came in. I mean, we welcomed them with open arms pre-World War II, after World War I, that, the calm between the two World War, after World War II, we welcomed them in only to be betrayed by them because they, they did not want to accept our way of life. They wanted to control our country and they're using our country to wage war against the rest of the world because israel and uh they don't have enough population to do it themselves so they're using us they, they will right. expend the lives of innocent american children 18 year old men and women and 20 year olds uh, to send them out to battle to fight and that's the other comment i was going to make about our politicians you know uh the drug cartels have a saying you know living in arizona i was you know near cartels uh, a great portion of my life. And um, they have a saying that we can give you silver or we can give you lead, which means, uh, you know, hey, we can bribe you or we can kill you. What do you want to do? So, you know, work with us and we'll let you know what we'll pay you off. Well, we need politicians who are strong enough to say, no, I'm not saying no to both. And said, I've got more lead than you do because I've got a police force and I've got a military that's going to back me and protect me, and we're going to come hunt for you. But we, we don't have politicians of that, that caliber. But we expect our 18-year-old, 20-year-old young men and women to take a rifle, put on a helmet, and go out into battle when it may be nearly certain death. 
I mean, you you look at World War II, you look at landing on Normandy, your your survival rate was not real high, but they did it anyway uh, because they you know they they just did it because they they were brave young men who were going to do what was the right thing to deliberate Europe. We need politicians with that kind of courage who are going to say, no, I'm not accepting your silver, and no, I'm not going to accept your lead. I'm going to use my lead to come get you guys. But we don't do that. Uh, you know, we, we have politicians who allow themselves to be bribed, allow themselves to be blackmailed, allow themselves to be intimidated. we got a bunch of cowards. Yeah. And we, we need people who have real spine, real backbone, and uh, who are able to stand up and say, you know what? Uh, this may be tough on me, but I'm going to do it. It may cost me my life, and I'm going to do the right thing for the right reason. People who are not willing to compromise their integrity and their morality just for the comfort of another day of life or, or a, a few material rewards, uh, rewards in this uh, this yeah. little five, eight year old life we get. You know, it's, it's, it's not worth it. I mean, what, what is your soul worth? What, what is right. that worth? Exactly. I mean, look at, look at, I mean, people, I mean, it's just, just puppets for the military industrial complex, you know, with insider trading and all these old people, Dan, Pelosi or Feinstein, what's her name? Feinstein, who just died recently. I mean, how did he get a net worth of what? hundred, two hundred million dollars? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Well, well, Pelosi came in there with nothing and she's worth 175 million plus right now. I mean, you, you look at, you know, Biden's uh, fortune has increased exponentially. All these guys come in there. It's systemic. And, you know, they they might have made 150000 a year before they were in the Congress, and then they retired 20 years later, and they're worth $50 million bucks. I mean, how do you do that on $174,000 of your salary? You don't. Yeah. You're, you're in somebody's pocket. You're, you're, you're doing insider trading. You're doing some things that are unscrupulous, that are putting money in your pocket. That's not what you're there for. Uh, our politicians don't serve the people they serve themselves. Yeah. We need a better class of politician. You know, um, we, we need, uh, somebody needs to monitor them in a way that is really strict. Right. That if, if uh, they have money in there, like this whole Joe Biden thing with Hunter and, and stuff, you know, they set up 22 shell companies to, to hide the money so they could launder it. You know, these things here, it just stinks on, uh, just, you just open the package, oh, that, that, that smells bad. You know, I mean, these, these aren't things that honest people do. And uh, right now, they can operate with impunity. They, there is no repercussions for them. Uh, they, they're, they're free to do it. They're free to go out and get rich. You know, line their pockets. Get as rich as you can. And but, pardon uh, themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really a tragic state of affairs. And we have to, um, to live with this. And these people pass laws that affect me and you know, I can now they're talking about bringing back the draft in the USA conscription again. You know, my son is going to be 25. Hopefully he's too old for that uh, now. But I don't want to see anybody's kids drafted, particularly by a government that looks at war the way this government has over the last 50 years. I mean, this is, this is not good. This, this is very unhealthy for the country. Now, if we had a system like Switzerland or like Singapore does, where everybody has to serve two years, everybody gets trained uh, to be a basic rifleman, uh, infantryman in, in the military, go along with that 100%. Everybody has to serve, unless you're physically unable, in which case we'll find some other job for you. Everybody yeah. Can do something. Yeah. Uh, but that way you've got a trained populace out there that if there ever is an invasion of any sort, um, yeah, I served uh, 20 years ago, but you're uh -huh. great. You're in. You know, here's your, here's your, you know, maintain, like the Swiss, you have to maintain a rifle in your home, 500 rounds of ammunition. You're ready to go in 20 minutes if you have to. Uh -huh. And uh, that, that's, that is the way to run a country. And if you did that, you wouldn't have all this criminality and gang activity going on around because if a gang in, in, intrudes on your block, every man on the street, is trained as a soldier. Exactly. Uh, yeah. The gang's going to so, get away from yeah. uh, doing that. They're not going to yeah. get away with your mom. That's they're how it should be, yeah. They're not going to rob your mom twice. You know, they're not, not, not going to beat up your mom and rob her two times. It, it'll happen once, but the problem is going to be handled. Uh -huh. And so there, there is merit in the system. But I would not want anyone drafted into the United States military today with the management it's going into. First of all, the US military has no leadership. It's run by administrators. Uh -huh. uh, these these you know, two, three, four star generals, you see, administrators. These men wouldn't know how to fight their way out of a paper bag. 
uh, if they had to. Ergo, the, uh, the wonderful record the U.S. has in every engagement that they lose. All they do is protract the, uh, the, uh, the period of time and keep the military contractors you know, providing you know, guns and ammunition for them. But they, they don't win anything. And um, we, we don't have a moral cause anymore. We, we've lost it. We, we've squandered it. Everybody felt bad for the U.S. Yeah. after. Well, let me ask you this, Mike. I mean, is there is there a fraction of a percentage of people within the military? Remember the uh, was it General Patton in the thirties? You know who exposed all this conspiracy thing? Uh, I mean, are there people like that? Smedley Butler. But Smedley Butler. I'm sorry, yeah, Butler. Oh, yeah. Smedley Butler was a guy who came out and exposed uh, uh, the attempt of a coup to take uh, Roosevelt out. Mm -hmm. He was a guy who was Wall Street there. and everything, you know, the whole oligarchies were behind it, right? War is a Racket was his book, it's very mm -hmm. famous. And uh, he came out and said, I was nothing but a high priced thug for Wall Street. Yeah. Uh, so now, Patton is, is famous uh, for saying after World War II was over and he was uh, a brand new in the armistice with Germany, he said, God, we fought on the wrong side. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, we, we should have been fighting on the German side. Yeah. Not on, on the very interesting. The yeah. And, they, he's dead eight days later. They, uh, they assassinated him wow. uh, for thinking that way. So wow. uh, we're, we're, there's some dirty characters in this world. Yeah. And uh, as I said before, we, humanity as a race, and we in the United States, we have no problems here we can't fix. But we have to have a political will to want to fix them. And right now, things are getting tough in the United States, but they're not tough enough yet. Uh, when things get a little rougher, if we had what's going on in the U.S., like what's going on in Palestine, we would have a better government than we have now. Yeah. I mean, it would, it would take about you know, three, three to six months of that kind of uh, upheaval in this country. And the, the United States government would change uh, overnight, recognizable change. Would not be the same old uh, business as usual types that we have. But like I said, we have only one party, the Uniparty, because the same top 10 donors to the Republicans are the top 10 donors to the, the Democrats. Right. And the, the donors are the ones who, who call the shot on what the platform's yeah. going to be. And uh, they may say it a different way, but the result is nothing ever changes. Yeah. So, Mike, I mean, I see you, I consider you like myself, like an optimistic realist, real realistic. But I mean, do you see like, like, I mean, of course we pray, I mean, I wish for peace, but uh, do you see like a, tr a positive transformation at the end of the tunnel uh, within the next years or decades? I well, you know, it, first of all, it's like, um, you know, it's like when you, like you gain weight, okay? You know, um, let's say you know, 10 years ago, you know, you weighed 175 pounds and now you weigh 250 pounds. Well, you didn't gain it overnight. You're not going to lose it overnight. <laughs> you know? You've got to, to work at it. But in, in a year or two years, three years, you, you may be able to get back to your old weight of 175 pounds. But you've got to, it's not going to happen in two or three days. And so we have a lot of corruption. We have a lot of waste. We have a lot of just things that are not right in, in the U.S. and in the world. But these can all be fixed. And like I said, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long-term and diligent effort to do it, but it can be done. We have no problems we can't fix. We just have to want them fixed bad enough and be willing to commit ourselves to getting them fixed. And that's really what yeah. we have to want to do it. And enough people have woken up. Would you would you agree to that? I mean, there is a percentage of people who I think of after all this shit that's been going on with the mRNA, you know, injections and people dying and, you know, I mean, fatal injuries and... I mean, I, even this whole, pal, you know, Palestine thing, I mean, if people have woken up. Would you agree there's a, a critical mass? Maybe not enough, but. That... Well, you know, well, I, I've heard critical mass is around 8 to 12 percent. Mm -hmm. I think we're pretty close to that, if not beyond that right now. I'll give you some examples. The, the vaccine nonsense. My niece, she is a college level, university level, division one school uh, rower, varsity team. Row, you know, the, you, know, you row the boats, you know, the, the, those teams. She's on that. She's a varsity rower. She got the vaccine. Her university forced her to get the vaccine. And now she has myocarditis. Oh, my God. And a uh, young girl, you know, early 20, and, uh, you know, tall, big, athletic as ever get out, but myocarditis is probably going to have the best of her life from the vaccine. And uh, the university forced it on her.
This is so I have another friend, one of my one of my very best friends. Uh, his wife had cancer. She's in remission for 15 years. She got the vaccine. Three months later, she's got what they're calling a turbo cancer. Turbo cancer. Yeah. It's eating her up inside. Oh my God. I, I, I hope for the best outcome, but I, I'm not optimistic. Yeah. Uh, because they, 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 they use an experimental vaccine. It's not really a vaccine. It's more of a gene therapy. Yeah. It is a vaccine and it teaches your body how to make uh, toxic proteins. Yeah. Uh, I don't see where the benefit on that type of therapy is. I think the pharmaceutical industry, which is Rockefeller controlled, exactly. uh, needs yeah. to be looked at critically uh, for this type of stuff. And, you know, the Hippocratic Oath of doctors is first do no harm. And so, um, you know, uh, you, they're doing harm. They're, they're, they're actively harming people. And so uh, we, we need to reevaluate, you know, how are we doing medicine in this country? Because it's... Yeah. it's or the U.S. Our lifespans are now decreasing instead of increasing. We exactly. Were, yeah. Great for a long time, but the last uh, you know, 10, 15 years, yeah. it's, that has changed. But so, I mean, that's you know, it's a can another different can of worms, uh, Mike. But you know that the DoD military, uh, you know, the whole DARPA. I mean, it's sort of a the, the pharmaceutical. Were actually, I mean, they've been doing this since the '60s. So the pharmaceutical was just a proxy to execute this whole agenda. But the you know. So there's a whole like box. <laughs> well, really, I, I look at this. There's a good book I'm going to recommend to you. It's called Guilt by Association mm -hmm. by a guy named Jeff Gates. I know Jeff. He was Senator Russell Long's chief of staff. He wrote the ERISA laws about the retirement systems in the U.S. Brilliant guy. Uh, but he wrote this book. And he documents how Jewish organized crime infiltrated the U.S. government and took it over. And... Um, you know, he's well-referenced, he's well-researched, he's got a bibliography that won't quit. He can prove everything he says. But it is a brilliant book, and that's the first book I read on this topic that really opened my eyes up. And it's one of these things, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Right. I got to read that book. No, I don't know. I've heard about it. Yeah. So, Mike, I don't want to, uh, you know, take up too much time. It's been a fascinating discussion and conversation with you. Uh, where can I, you know, send people to, I mean, besides veterans today, uh, do you want to like any final remarks? I, I, I put some stuff up on uh, the Intel drop. I'm doing a weekly uh, podcast uh, with a guy named Scott Bennett on um, Global Freedom TV. Uh, they can they can follow me there. I, I, I do that. Uh, they, they have a channel on Rumble. So uh, it's live on Rumble on Monday night at uh, uh, six o'clock Pacific uh, time. And so I, I do that uh, weekly, but I've, I've not been publishing much lately. I'm working on uh, a white paper right now uh, about, you know, foreign and domestic policy changes that the U.S. has to make if we want to survive and not just survive, but turn ourselves back into a thriving uh, you know, a, a country, both morally uh, and as well as financial. You know, the, the financial part is secondary. Well, our, our morality has to come first. I mean, who we are as a people how we want to live our lives and how we want other people to view us and how we wish to treat other people. Those are critical things. And it's time for us to become uh, more compassionate uh, to the rest of the world. I love your approach. Very, you know, it's, yeah, I love your ethos, uh, Mike. So, yeah. So thank you so much, Mike. I'll, I'll put those all in the show notes. Uh, any final words? Uh, where's wisdom? We've already said enough. I could talk to you for oh, hours. Yeah. Again, like I said, we've just barely touched the surface on, on these topics. Yeah. Because, uh, each of these topics deserves so much more uh, analysis and so much more disclosure as to how we got here and you know, how do we reach these conclusions. And uh, we can schedule that for other times if you're interested. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to. One of my goals is to educate people out there so they know, understand not just what I'm saying, but why I'm saying it. And maybe they'll understand, and maybe they'll have an idea of their own that's even better than something I've thought of. And I, I want to inspire people to all be uh, be co-creators in this reality here, and, and help uh, help everyone you know, manifest in, in this 3D reality we live in something uh, that 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 suits them uh, in, in what their needs are. So, well, thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah. Um... I couldn't, I couldn't say it better. <laughs> so, Mike, thank you so much again, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, well, thank you so much. Stay in touch, please. I, I, I enjoyed I it. <laughs>